Brother Luke, uh, Sin City Preacher, uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke, and today we have the fifth part of our series, The Identity of Jesus. If you haven't seen the prior episodes, uh, you can go to my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, and you can see the first four episodes of this topic. Uh, today we're going to uh, basically go over the titles of Jesus. There's a lot of them. We're going to try to go through them very quickly so we can get through them all. But first, let me introduce the panelists here today. We have Brother Joseph. His channel is uh, Jay Byron. Uh, Brother Joseph, you want to say hi to everybody? Uh, hello. Uh, great to be here. I love this study. Okay. And we have Brother Jackson. His channel is Mecca Wing Zero. Jackson? Great to be here, Luke. Thank you for calling me in the invite and everything. Okay. And then, then we have Brother Austin. His channel is Austin Bell. This is his first time joining us in this, uh, on the panel here, so I'm happy that Austin was interested to join us. Brother Austin, do you want to say anything to the before we get started? Yeah, how's it going, everybody? Glad to be here in uh, Galaxy Dreams. I finally got my mic. <laughs> yeah, very good. Yeah, the, she's been in almost all of these broadcasts, but she's out of, out of state right now, uh, so she she wasn't able to join us, but uh, right. uh, it's not because she heard you were going to be on the panel. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go through this one verse at a time, and everybody, uh, I want everybody to get a chance to just give a little insights on it, and then we'll go on to the next verse. Uh, this verse is uh, titled "Jesus is Adam." We go to First Corinthians 15:45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Okay, well let me introduce, uh, before we go on, I just read the first verse, Brother Ronnie. Uh, you got your uh, audio on? Okay, click your audio on. Brother Ronnie, click your audio on. Upper right hand corner. Yeah, upper right hand. Okay, there you are. Okay. Uh, turn your volume down so I can get the feedback. Okay? All right. There you are. And either when you, If you're not talking, mute the microphone or turn the volume down, or uh, and then when you, you, when you decide to talk, uh, then you turn the mic on, then you won't get the feedback. Okay, uh, this is uh, Brother Ronnie just joined us. Uh, his channel is Hood Minister. And uh, Brother Ronnie, um, we're going to uh, go through this one verse at a time, but we don't want to go into great detail in these verses. I have a lot of verses. We want to cover them very quickly. And th these are the titles of Jesus. The first one is Adam. And it's 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Okay, let's start with, uh, as I see you guys on the screen here, I'll just go from my left to right and then start with uh, Gabe Byron. Brother Joseph? Uh, yeah, very uh, very fascinating scripture. I mean, you could take any one of these scriptures and do an entire study on it. But uh, this one in particular uh, is fascinating. It says that Adam was made a living soul. Uh, it, he was also a spirit, uh, I believe, had a, a spirit that was alive until he uh, violated God's law or violated his uh, request not to eat of the tree. And when, say, when, he's, when God told him, you'll certainly die, I think that his spirit died immediately. And, his, and he continued as a soul man but he eventually died physically also. And I think Christ, uh, when we accept him, our spirit, which is dead, is made alive. Mm -hmm. So when he calls uh, Adam the first Adam and Jesus the last Adam, uh, being a title for Jesus, what does it mean by the last Adam? Uh, Brother Jackson? Well, the word Adam, if I understand correctly, means man. Like I've, I've thought for a while, and correct me if I'm wrong, that their names probably weren't Adam and Eve, but it was just calling them man and woman. And it, this is kind of in line with when it says in Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega, meaning Jesus is the first and the last. 
it's saying that no one is before Jesus and nobody's after him. That's what that's what I would have thought. Mm -hmm. I never really considered that uh, their names were not Adam and Eve, but they're just. Uh, but you know, all of them. It seems like every character in the Bible, their name is actually describes their personality. There's <laughs> something about them. Yeah. Well, I, I always know. thought of Adam and Eve as titles. They could have been their name. I'm not. I'm not saying I know that. I'm just saying that's how I have have thought about it. Yeah. Well, I I, I think that uh, it's a good idea. I, I I haven't thought about it before, but uh, it makes sense to me. Uh, Brother Ronnie, uh, why is Adam? Why is Jesus called the last Adam? Well, I would say because uh, his body, <clears throat> like the first Adam, was created by God. Although uh, the first Adam was made from the dust of the earth, Jesus' body was made within the womb of Mary. Uh, the first Adam brought us into sin. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, uh, redeemed us out of it through the cross. Okay, very good, thank you. And uh, bro Brother Austin, what do you want to say about this verse? Uh, I'm just going to go really quick. I just think that after the first Adam in the flesh was corrupted, Christ came in the Spirit, and what Brother Ronnie did, he redeemed us through the Spirit to sanctify us. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I think you've already made some good points, but what comes to my mind as far as first Adam and last Adam um, is the, um, the, the, the first Adam, of course, we were born in his likeness. Now, it, it, the Bible says... God created man, and let us create man in our image, our likeness. Uh, we discussed that in many other episodes about man being triune, body, soul, and spirit, and God being triune, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, but when, when God created Adam, he actually created him. Uh, and, but then everybody since Adam has been procreated uh, because through... Uh, uh, intercourse, sexual reproduction, God didn't really uh, create Luke or Joe or Ronnie. He didn't create us. He created Adam. And you and I are really procreations. A result of what God put in place, now God probably had us in mind from before the foundation of the world. He knew about us, and we were elect from the beginning and so on, uh, but we weren't really created directly, not a direct creation of God. Uh, but in Jesus' case, and, and now Adam, of course, we all being like Adam, when he fell and his uh, spirit was severed from God and he had this separation, we were all born with this dead spirit. So that's what all mankind has in, in common. We're born uh, with a body and a soul and a dead spirit, and we need to get regenerated, uh, born again, with our spirit connected to, to God. Uh, but... Uh, Jesus, being the, the last Adam, he's in the, the fir, really the first of a new version of mankind. Uh, and we are, once we're born again, then we're a child of God, like Jesus is, the, is the, son of, the Son of God. We are a son of God or a daughter of God because of this regeneration. So I, I, I see Adam as the first of his kind and Jesus as uh, the first of his kind as far as uh, his, the way he was as a man. Anybody want to make comment on that before we move on to the next verse? Okay. The next title of Jesus is Advocate. Uh, 1 John 2 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. An advocate with the Father. Okay, brother, brother Joseph, you get to go first. Uh, well, I, I, I see him. Uh, it, I think it's a real clear picture of, of uh, what he's done for us. He's he's made the sacrifice, and he and Satan, we are, we are told, stands before the Father unto this day, accusing us. He's the great accuser. Uh, it, it's funny how it takes on a court uh, atmosphere with uh, Christ being our advocate and uh, Lucifer being or Satan being our accuser. The Father being the judge of all things. Fascinating. Okay. Uh, I got distracted while you're talking, brother. I'm sorry, uh, because I recalled uh, Brother Austin said that uh, make sure to tell Galaxy Dreams he got his uh, webcam, but I noticed that his cam is not on. And I wonder if it's not functioning or 
Uh, Brother Austin, are you, are you choosing just to have your icon up instead of your video? No, I'm sorry. I only have a microphone right now. I don't have a, a camera. Is that, oh, okay. is that a problem? All right. all right. I wanted to get it working correctly if, uh, if uh, you had it. Okay, that's all right then. Well, we're going to brew. Brother Joseph, I'm sorry. I didn't really hear anything you said. I'm sorry because my mind was thinking about that other thing. So could you either repeat it or expound a little more on that? Uh, real quickly, it wasn't that fascinating as much. I, I just I felt that, that it was fascinating to me how that heaven takes on a courtroom type arrangement with Satan being the accuser, Christ being our advocate, the Father being the final arbiter, the judge. Uh, I mean, it's very much like you're uh, at the municipal court building. <laughs> that's really good. It's that's true. It's uh, exactly uh, as it is described in the scriptures. Uh, Brother Jackson, why is Jesus our advocate? Well, the the thing I think about is, you know, being a comic book fan, I think of Daredevil, the man without fear, and how when in his alter ego he's a lawyer. He's known as being such a good lawyer that the, the, the criminals who don't realize that he's actually the superhero want to hire him sometimes to defend them. When we say we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus, I think of us being on court, being at court, kind of like the judgment seat of Christ or whatever. And we have such a fierce eternity, such a, such a uh, flawless eternity, that even if we sin, because we have an advocate with the Father, should comfort us and that we will not face condemnation for it. Okay, uh, that's very good. I want to make this question and kind of revise the question a little bit for Brother Ronnie. But how is Jesus advocating for us, or is it already done? He's done his advocating. Is he doing it now, or is it to come? Is advocating at the uh, these judgments, the, the great white, the judgment seat of Christ? Uh, is that past, present, or future? And what exactly is the Jesus say as he advocates for us? Ronnie, we can't hear you. Ronnie. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I see Jesus as a, as a lawyer too, but his blood is all sufficient. It's like he just turns to, to the Father and uh, shows him his hands, and his blood is sufficient for all of our sins, past, present, and future. No matter what the accuser brings against us, you know, we have that advocate with the Father, uh, Jesus Christ. But I also see this as a, a, a working in the legal realm also, because God is, I mean, even the angels are interested in, in, our, in the gospel. So, uh, and Satan is accuser. He's, he's trying every way, which way he can, probably still to try and convince other uh, angels to follow him. But God is going to show himself just you know, through all this in the end. Okay. Uh, Brother Austin, did you... Uh do you uh, have any opinion as to whether this is past, present, or future as far as this advocating that Jesus uh, does? Uh, I say it stands for all time. I just want to point out a kind of like a side note on this. I uh, I realize that in a lot of scripture, uh, it's a reference to Christ in a word. Uh, an example of this is uh, we read, uh, he's the truth, the way, the light, the love. Uh, the answer, the gate, the door, the peace, the spirit, hope, the great I am, the life. Mm -hmm. And just in another one is this, the, uh, also along with the advocate, he's also the mediator. And in uh, 1 Timothy 2.5, uh, he says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, and that man is Christ Jesus. So I mean, he, uh, and we can look at it as the advocate or the intercessor, the great intercessor, but I, it's all for the same purpose, the one who speaks on our behalf to the the Almighty, as in like John 14, 6, how he said, no one can go to the Father except by me. We have to go through Christ, and he takes on, as he did take on all of our sins at the day of judgment, how he speaks on our behalf. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, nobody's expressed an opinion whether uh, Satan is actually still accusing us is present tense right now accusing us, and Jesus is currently up there advocating for us, uh, or if that's not necessary because it's already settled, uh, because 
basically, what I think Jesus, that all he really needs to do is says that uh, he's mine. To each one of us, he just says he's mine. That's all he needs to do. He's with me. Um, but I guess nobody really has uh, even thought about it or uh, has a strong opinion as to whether this is uh, currently going on or not. Poor little brother Zelsa from there. There's some feedback. So somebody uh, mute your mic or turn the volume down. Okay. Go ahead, Brother Joseph. Joseph. Uh, I, I believe that uh, the scripture indicates he may still be advocating for us. It, we remember in Job when he went before the Father's throne and, and said, uh, I've been roaming to and fro, you know, and, and uh, accuses Job after the Father points, out, points him out to us. Uh, you know, in the New Testament, it says at some point in the, in the book of Revelation, Satan is no longer allowed to approach the Father's throne. So he's approaching him to accuse the saints to this day, I believe. And the fact that it, in Revelation it says he accuses the saints, it would tell me it's uh, post, uh, post uh, sacrifice. Okay. Uh, I, yeah, this is, uh, we, we think of God as being uh, loving. Merciful, just, gracious, and, and so I think the idea that this is some kind of a judicial system, everybody's going to get a fair hearing, uh, and uh, so you've got the judgment seat of Christ, because our our standing before God is already settled for all time. Our stand, we have good standing, we have right standing, righteousness imputed to us because Jesus is our Savior. Uh, but so we go to this great this judgment seat of Christ, not to get judged for our standing, but to, to be judged for our works, our ministry, to see what rewards we get. But his uh, judicial system has another place called the Great White Throne Judgment, and that's the people who do not have good standing, and they go to get judged on their standing. Their their standing is lost, uh, unrighteous, and uh, we know that the unrighteous. Uh, they have all have their place in the lake of fire in the second death. So they're basically, I think they're really going there to the great white throne judgment, uh, not to get judged because they're already, the Bible says, if you believe on Jesus, you're not condemned. If you do not believe on Jesus, you are condemned already. They're already condemned. They're going to just get sentenced. Um, all right, we're going to move on unless someone wants to add more to this idea of Jesus being our advocate. The next one, uh, we're, we're uh, ahead, uh, what about, um, you know, in 1 John 1, 8 and 9, it says, if we confess our sins, uh, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins uh, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we're positionally saved forever. I think uh, he could be our advocate. The Lord could be our advocate, too, during those times to get us uh, relationship-wise uh, back into order. Because mm -hmm. uh, I don't know about a lot of people, but when I sin, I usually try and confess it. And it's not that I think I'll lose my salvation. It's uh, that I know I, I've been convicted, and my relationship is then, I feel like it's restored. Mm -hmm. well, Does that yeah, have something to do with it? This topic, well, yeah, that, that's a possibility. I haven't thought of that before, but the whole idea of 1 John 1.9 1, and confessing to... Some people think it's confessing to restore your salvation. Other people think it's confessing to restore your fellowship. Uh, but to me, uh, I've expressed my opinion on this before. I don't think that God uh, turns his back on us just because we got some sin that's unconfessed. Our, our fellowship with God, God's always there ready to embrace us and have fellowship with us. Uh, I think us confessing, continuing to confess, is, is because of our own guilty conscience so that we can feel accepted again. Not yeah, that's kind of like what I meant. Yeah. Uh, but that's that's a probably a minority position. A lot of people feel that God shuns them, and the only way you can refor restore your fellowship is to con continually use 1 John 1, 9. Now, that could drive you nuts. <laughs> yeah. But you went too far with it. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, 1 John 1, 9 could also be looked at is that... Uh, um, in order to get saved, oh, we, yeah. we have to either confess or come to the conclusion, whether you do it verbally uh, or whether you just do it in your own mind, in your heart, you come to the conclusion that you're a sinner and you're, you need to be saved. This is what salvation is based upon, understanding we're lost and there's a need to be saved. 
and Jesus is the only one that can save us. So First John 1, 9, I could see being used, interpreted in that way, where it's saying, if we confess our sins, he was faithful to forgive us our sins, and uh, whatever it is. Uh, and uh, so that's the idea of being, if a person's lost, they confess that they're a sinner and they need to be saved. Okay. Uh, Brother Joseph, did you raise your hand? Uh, no, I didn't. But uh, now that you took the time to call my name, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think it's. I think Ron made a very good point, uh, and I think you did earlier, whether you realize it or not. I, I think that Satan has to get permission to attack the saints in any way that he does, and I think he uses our works before the Lord to gain a foothold. Like, hey, look at uh, Brother Luke. You're protecting him in this area, but because of this, you ought to let me have a shot at him. And, the father, of course, either has to say yea or nay, and I think that goes on constantly. You know, that sounds a little like Job to me. Right, that's what I was about to say. Well, then say it, Brother Jackson, say it. I was just about to draw a conclusion, or, or draw a parallel with the Job as well there, because Job was a righteous man and everything. Satan challenged God, saying, well, he's only this way because you're blessing him so much and everything. And... I imagine that this kind of thing goes on in more cases besides just with Job. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, in Job we see that Satan's serving as this uh, this uh, accuser in Job, and that uh, however we don't see Jesus in there being an advocate for Job. That's true. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the next next. Verse uh, and it really has two titles basically. Um, it is uh, we're going to go Revelation one eight. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So we have really uh, two titles here: Alpha and Omega, and the Almighty. And we'll start off with, oh, uh, I just realized, uh, Brother Austin, I didn't get you to comment on that last point uh, before we move on. Brother Austin? Yeah, I apologize. What was wrong? Did you? I, I forgot to call on you to see if you wanted to say something about the last point before we moved on. It was about the advocate? Yeah. Yeah, I mentioned that the how he was uh, how he, he was in many verses, like in many different words, and then okay. I, I mentioned about mediator. Right. Okay, so you've uh, you got your... Uh, fair chance to get you put in your I don't want you to put in two cents I want you to put in ten cents everybody okay no problem okay so we're going to start with you first this time uh, brother Austin uh, okay. how do you see this uh, uh, title of Alpha and Omega uh, how it's put is a really strong uh, it's a really strong verse when it's when it's preached it's a, it should be dealt with accordingly. It's not something that's so lightly. It's a, it's a very serious command almost. It's it, it kind of all refer to as in uh, when Moses is asking God back in uh, just Exodus 3.14, he's asking him, what should we call you? And he just automatically just stands with a firm, authoritative voice saying, the great I am, I am that I am. So I think when he says that this Alpha and Omega, I think it's just another kind of, Authoritative command saying, "I am the, I am the, I am the beginning and I am the end." You know, there is nothing that comes before me or after me. There is no other way. And uh, also, you have to forgive me. I don't know the exact verse, but when he says he's the jealous God, he means that you know I am the only being in the entire universe that created it and made it and existed. And I just think that when he puts it, it's to be dealt with accordingly and not to be something as like, oh well, you know, we can just work around it. It's, you know, it's directly directed right at them. Yeah, uh, there, there are many, many examples that we can use to say that uh, Jesus, the Father, all through scriptures, is claiming this exclusive status. Right. And, and he is jealous. He doesn't want anybody to confuse and think that there's any other gods and, uh, except for false gods. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, Brother Ronnie, what do you say about Alpha and Omega? Well, I can go uh, same thing. Uh, he's the beginning and he's the end, but he's out. God is outside of time and and uh, space. We live in this uh, four those are four dimensions, including time. And God created time. God lives outside of time. 
uh, in everlasting. <clears throat> it reminds me of that verse in Micah 5, 2, where it says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee he shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler of Israel, whose going forth has been from old, from everlasting. So we see that the Lord Jesus Christ was, you know, before time, uh, before any creation. And John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same as in the beginning with God. So uh, I see him, Jesus Christ, as God prior to uh, time coming into existence, prior to creation, um, and also becoming a man, you know, to redeem mankind from their sins. Whoever believes on him, and then to the end, because there's going to be a culmination, and God is the, uh, the the author of all creation. He's going to be the finisher of it, and we're going to go on to that uh, uh, new to the new heavens and new earth created in righteousness that the Lord talks about at the end of Revelation. So I see him who he is. He is God. Okay, thank you. The, uh, the idea of the title Alpha and Omega, uh, sometimes uh, to, better, to best understand a verse or a, a term, uh, you just you go to the context, and right here in the same verse you have the context. It says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. So if we want to know what Alpha and Omega mean, it means the beginning and the ending. So Brother Jackson... Or you think that that is a valid point, that the beginning and the ending is, is kind of defining the term Alpha and Omega? I, I do, and I, I'm kind of surprised that no one has brought up yet, at least that I've heard, that Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet, and Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet, which is um, proving this proving this idea that, uh, that he's saying, what he's saying is, I'm the beginning and the end. You know, it all starts with me and it all ends with me, pretty much. Okay, let me ask you about uh, looking at this in the concept of time. Uh, we know from other scriptures that Jesus is the creator. Uh, and we have uh, uh, dimensions. Uh, you know, you've got, you've got matter, you've got energy, you've got time, you've got height, width, depth, time. And Jesus created all this. None of this existed until the Word created, created all things. So, in, he, could you say that he is, the, he is the cause of the beginning? When it says he is the beginning, could that be interpreted that he caused the beginning? He started everything. I Okay, Brother Jackson, go ahead. Finish. Oh, I was just going to say, I suppose it could be interpreted that way, but I have more of a tendency to take what he's saying literally, that he's actually talking about himself, that he is the beginning, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, not I cause the Alpha and the Omega, for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you say he, uh, he is the beginning, do you see any potential problem uh, that, that a, a cultist could use that verse? How could that could be used? Jackson? Oh, you're still talking to me. I thought you were talking to Jay at this point. Um, I, I'm trying to think. I mean, maybe I'm just, you know, I, I, I have a hard time imagining how a cultist could say, could say that because a cultist generally thinks that Jesus is not God, and how could anything besides God be the beginning and be the end? Well, okay. I'll ask uh, Brother Joseph to comment further on this point, but the, uh, you have the idea of, we discussed in prior videos the idea that the uh, Jesus is the firstborn, he is the uh, first begotten, uh, and now we have he is the, the beginning. And these are all like cousins of, to make the same point, that perhaps he had a beginning, he's not eternal. Because he is the beginning. Before time, the first God thing God created was the firstborn of creation. Uh, first, he's actually said the verse says the firstborn over creation. But they would like to make it seem like Jesus is the first one created, and then Jesus created everything else. Uh, brother, 
Who raised their hand on that? Was it Ronnie or, or Joe? Ronnie, go ahead. Well, I just want to throw something in here. I think I find it interesting, too, uh, as my brother was saying about Alpha and Omega being letters. Uh, they're letters in the Greek alphabet, but they make up a... Uh, you know, it, 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 like the Holy Spirit is twisting this in with the Word, you know, as He is the Word of God. The Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Tav, you know, the beginning and the end. It's the spoken Word of God that brought all creation into being. Uh, you'd have to be God to do that. Okay, Brother Joseph, what, do you think that? <laughs> I, I want to really expound on the point that how cultists can use begotten, firstborn, and the beginning. And they could use that to try to argue that uh, Jesus was the first one created. Yeah, I, I think this is a, a huge cornerstone in the whole study. Is uh, is the the uh, assessment that Christ is indeed God, because that's where a lot of cults uh, and errant religions go. Uh, I like I don't like the way the King James version has this. The, it's called the Revelation of John the Divine, Saint John the Divine. If you go to uh, the first verse, we'll find out more accurately that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And as the revelation of Jesus Christ, when he says, I am the Almighty, and I am the Alpha and the Omega, I think that's proof positive uh, to anyone who believes the literal interpretation that, that Jesus Christ is God. Yeah. Okay, that was the point I was going to go to next, is that uh, I've said that uh, the, to understand a verse, you look at all, all the verses around it. Uh, and, of course, that's the context, the immediate context. And then you have to look at the context from the, all, the totality of all the scriptures, how it all works together. Uh, but sometimes the best answer is right in the same verse. And right here we have the answer with the very end of the verse it says, the Almighty. So Jesus has the title of the Almighty. And there's only one Almighty. There, can't, there can never be uh, two Almighties because it would, it would uh, change the meaning of the word. The Almighty. <laughs> so, uh, um, the Almighty is is a title for God Almighty. And so, if someone wants to argue that uh, the Alpha and Omega means that Jesus is the beginning, He had a beginning, He was created. Then, at the end of the verse, it, it destroys that whole argument because it also says that He is the Almighty. He is God Almighty. He is Jehovah God Almighty. And these are the Jehovah Witnesses and uh, some others that try to make him into created being. Okay, um, now let's go to uh, Hebrews 12.2. Uh, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So the title we have in this verse here for Jesus is, Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. So what do we get out of the, the term, Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith? Uh, who wants to go first on it? Well, I'll, I'll be glad to, uh, Luke. Uh, okay. The author and finisher, I, I, I think that's another way of saying the, the Alpha Omega. I mean, he, he's the one who wrote this script, this great manuscript we're living in, and uh, he's the one who finished the book. Okay. So you, uh, you're looking at uh, as the word faith in, in terms of... Um, there's a, there's a verse in the Bible that says, uh, uh, test yourself whether you be in the faith. And, and a lot of people want to take that verse and make, make it into a works verse. So look at your life and see if you've uh, changed enough and, uh, to prove if you really are saved. Uh, but to me, test yourself whether you be in the faith uh, is talking about test yourself to see if your salvation doctrine is correct. Is your faith really in Jesus. Uh, what is that scratching sound? 
weird. Um, so test what he be in the face. The word face means does it mean that? Let me ask everybody just to don't move for a second. Everybody, stop moving. Okay. What is that sound? It's not, it sounds like paper shuffling. It's very distracting. Okay. Um, all right. So let me try to get back to a point, but I couldn't hardly focus because of that sound in the background. Uh, so it says the author and finisher of our, of our faith. One way of looking at this is that he is the um, he's the one that gives you your faith to believe. You don't have faith unless Jesus gives it to you. Another way of looking at it is, as Brother Joseph was trying to point out there, or did point out, is that uh, he's the author and finisher of our faith in terms of everything we're supposed to believe. Right, Brother Joseph? Is that what you're saying? What's that's, that's, right. Right. that's right. Oh, Brother... Hello, sister. Glad you could join us. Hey, sorry I'm late. That's all right. Uh, you're, all, you're welcome anytime. Anytime you can join us. Um, okay, so um, let me ask Brother Joseph to answer this first because I'm kind of replying to what you said. You said author of Finish of Our Faith as he is the one that wrote down and kind of conceived this whole idea of our religion, our beliefs, our scriptures. Uh, and I'm saying, is it is it faith in that respect, or is it faith, a personal faith that you personally believe in Jesus for your salvation? Well, in in this context, Luke, uh, I I can see it in a different way. Uh, just by what you just said, I would say that the faith that's spoken of here is the evidence. Uh, the, your faith is the evidence of things unseen. Okay. All right. Um, hello, Eve. Uh, we're, we're talking about right now these different titles for Jesus, and we're on like the fifth or sixth verse, we, and we're talking about uh, Jesus is the author and finisher of our, of our faith, Hebrews 12, 2. Okay? Uh, okay, so first of all, does everybody see the distinction between what Brother Joseph posed and what I posed? And I'm not saying one way is, is correct way to look at this. But can, can you clearly see the distinction between these two ideas? Or, or did I just confuse everybody? Can anybody see this distinction? Okay. All right. Well, let me ask it this way then. Uh, a Calvinist could take this verse and claim that uh, uh, Tulip. Uh, total depravity means that you do not have total inability. You do not have the ability to believe. You don't have the ability. You're dead spiritually. You cannot believe. It's impossible for you to become a believer and have faith. Um, and then hit the next point, you, T-U, unconditional election, for no reason, nothing has anything to do with God, randomly selects people and he zaps them and makes them believe. So they would take this verse and say, see, God's the author and finisher of your faith. You would not have faith unless God gave it to you. It had nothing to do with your free will, and, and you're deciding that I'm going to trust Jesus. And you see that the, how this verse could be used by a Calvinist. And, and so is the verse talking about our own personal faith, or is it talking about the author and finisher of our, of our faith collectively, the body of Christ, the doctrine that we believe in? Okay? Who wants to comment on that? I, 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 well, sorry. I personally think the, the case for having it be the our faith collectively is pretty strong because he's writing to an entire church here at Hebrews, not to a single person. Okay. All right. All right. What about the... What about the idea that I posed, how Calvinists can use this verse to try to uh, make the point that you don't have the uh, choice to believe or not. God is the author of the he, he decided that he was going to make Eve into a believer, and he was ad decided that he was going to make Eve's cousin, 
a non-believer. Well, that would show, uh, throw out John 3.16, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, there's all kinds of verses that disprove all five points of, of, of TULIP. Mm -hmm. All kinds of verses. Every, every point of TULIP is obviously wrong, and none of it... But see, I'm trying to point out to you in this verse how a Calvinist could use this verse. All right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Um, Nobody else wants to expound on that, so I'll move on to the next uh, verse, Matthew 12, 18. Uh, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. So the, the title for Jesus in this verse is, My Beloved. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, mm -hmm. beloved son. So Jesus is uh, God's beloved son. Now, does any uh, scripture come to mind where Jesus, where God says, this is my beloved son? That is baptism, I believe. Yeah, yeah. At the baptism, yes. You have Jesus being baptized in the flesh. You have a voice coming down from heaven. The Father saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then you have the Holy Spirit ascending in the manner of a dove above Jesus. John the Baptist saw it. So here you have all persons of the Godhead simultaneously existing at the same place and time, uh, defeating the idea of modalism, but we have Jesus getting the title, My Beloved Son. Mm -hmm. Okay, so who wants to talk about Jesus and this Beloved Son title? Uh, if I could just put in, uh, he's also known as the Only Begotten. Uh, We're going to go to that one. We, okay. we've, got, we've got that one and also the... Uh, you know, the, the, uh, all the names and titles you mentioned when you first spoke, they're on this list. So we're, we're going to go on one at a time. Okay, I apologize. I didn't know that you, I, I kind of rushed through them a little bit, so I kind of gave it That's all right. But uh, well, we're going to go one at a time, and uh, just the idea of being beloved son. Now, this is another title for Jesus. Correct. Uh, I guess nothing needs to be said about the, the title beloved son. Uh, now let's go to John 6.32. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. So Jesus is referred to as the bread of life in the scriptures. So the term bread of life, uh, let's, let's start with, uh, with Brother Austin. The bread of life. Uh, in John 6.35? Just the title, Bread of Life, in general. Anything you want to say about that title? Um, oh, I will touch on this. I like. I think that it was really cool how he mentioned this to uh, when he was getting tempted by Satan in the desert. Yeah. And how Satan was trying to tempt him by making him try to turn, the rock, uh, turn these rocks into bread. And how uh, Christ quoted, uh, I that was kind of a first time too. We see Satan knowing the scriptures very well because he quoted scripture as Christ as Christ quoted scripture. And then Christ was quoting that man should not live on bread alone, but every word of the living God. Mm -hmm. And then if we look at that one more time, I uh, we make a distinction in John six sixty three when he's when Christ says every word he speaks to us. Uh, I'm, I apologize. It is spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So the bread is, since Christ is in the spirit, what he is is he gives us more than just bread. He gives us more than just a food. His, his inner being with us is life in general. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so what other examples can relate to this idea of Jesus being this red? Uh, probably maybe at the the Last Supper too. When he, when he's see the the Catholics really look at that as like the communion part. I just look at it as symbolic as how he he gave up his his flesh for us, and then how he symbolizes the wine for his blood, and how he gave that up for us also. Okay. Let's move on to Eve. Eve, I, I don't see your video, but I'm assuming you're listening. Do you have anything to say about Jesus being the bread of life? Um, yeah. Um, well, you know, it brings up to me where he, he talks about, uh, come to me and you'll hunger no more, come to me and you'll thirst no more. He is the bread and he is the living water. So... Okay. There's a lot of cases where bread is in the Bible. Uh, in this very verse, Jesus is referring to one of those, talking about the manna from heaven that God gave the Jews when they're in the wilderness. Uh, and he says that uh, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father gave it you the true bread from heaven. Uh, so this bread is what, without food, we die, right? So the, this bread is necessary to live. And uh, Jesus is called the bread of life because we need him to live to get life everlasting. Uh, the communion was mentioned by Austin where he said, this is my body. This bread, he broke the bread and said, this is my body. And so there's uh, numerous examples that we could probably think of. Can anybody think of any other cases where we read as an analogy for Jesus. Yes, Ronnie. Well, I kind of agree with you. It's uh, these are sustenance. Um, our spirits are, you know, when we're born again, before we're born again, we're always hungry. We're always looking. You know, we're looking for the truth. We're looking for God. I think all people are. You know, in one way or another, they have that hunger, that search for God, and. Uh, Jesus Christ is that true bread of heaven that, that gives our soul, our spirit, sustenance. Uh, he, you know, he is the water of life, too. I mean, we're satisfied when we come to him. We know that, you know, we're satisfied enough that we know that everything else is uh, full, you know. We just know that who Jesus Christ is. And he is that, that, that infilling that we desperately need to sustain our uh, spiritual life and be satisfied. Yeah, I really like I really like what you said there, Ron. Uh, no, there's, there's that, there that God-shaped void that we're always hungry for that only He can fill. And I'd also note that uh, the, the Lord's always talking about the water being the Spirit and uh, Him being the bread. And uh, I think the Father is some other uh, something else. I don't know. There's something there. I'm just not thinking of it. Okay. Um. I was uh, had the thought in my mind, but uh, the the audio part of your talk there, Joseph, was all broken up, so it threw me off. I got what I was going to say. Um, but let's let's move on then, and I'll, maybe I'll think of it in a minute. Unless someone wants to say more about Jesus being the bread of life, I'll move on to the next one. Okay, let's go to Hebrews two ten. And uh, this one is a captain of salvation. Uh, for it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So here we have another title for Jesus. He is the captain of salvation. Okay, uh, let's start with Brother Jackson. What does it mean he's the captain? Captain is clearly a uh, symbol of authority. For example, if you're on a ship, the captain is the one who's in charge. It's the highest respected person, etc. So I, then I think when, it, when I think it says here that he is the captain of their salvation, it's saying he's in charge of it. It, it really disputes... The two ideas. It disputes the idea that faith alone is not enough, because that would mean if we, we have to commit our lives and everything, we have to do all that stuff, that would make us the captain or co-captain or whatever of our salvation. And also, 
it, it, in my opinion, it also refutes the idea of a loss of salvation, that you can later lose it, because that would mean that the captain of the ship sunk the ship, and we know Jesus is perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that was well, well said. I, uh, very good point. Uh, you made me think of the idea that uh, people want to be the co-captain. And, uh, or at least a deckhand where they're doing some kind of work and, and helping. But he's totally in charge. He's the captain. If, if, it, if we were going to be compared to anybody on that ship, we're just passengers. Right. And, and we're passengers, and he's the captain. He's our, our life vest. Okay. Uh, who else wants to talk about the term captain of our salvation? I just want to note, I've never heard this verse before. I've never, ever heard him called the captain, so this is a new one for me. <laughs> That's good. I like it when uh, you come up with something you've never heard of before. Okay, let's go to um, a cornerstone. Psalm 118.22. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. Well, Wait, well, th <clears throat> this kind of reminds me of uh, Revelation um, and also a couple other scriptures, and, and I'm not, I believe they're in Hebrews, uh, that talks about, you know, we're lively stones and the apostles were the foundation of the city. Yet Christ is that cornerstone. He is the um, he's the very the very thing that upholds it all. You know, he's that um, yeah, he's the first and, and the last, the beginning and the end. Yeah, so, that really does. Uh, that verse really does tell us a lot. That he's the cornerstone. The apostles were the foundation, and there were these lively stones. Um, I'm not sure what the li lively stone really means, uh, but it really tells us. Jesus, it's all based upon Jesus, and then what the apostles lay out for us in the scriptures. You know, this is our foundation. And after that, uh, uh, we're, we're part of this building. But, but we're not the foundation, we're not the cornerstone. Okay? What's significant about being a cornerstone, anyway? Well, isn't that like the, uh, the very thing that upholds everything? Um, yeah, the chief foundation stone. Well, a lot of people would say the word capstone, too. I think capstone and cornerstone is really the same thing. When you lay the first stone down, it's, it's what makes everything right. If, it, if it's laid wrong, then you cannot make everything else right because the first stone was wrong. The first stone has to be in perfect position, otherwise the plan falls apart because you didn't, you didn't start off correctly. So we start off with Jesus being our Savior. <laughs> That's the beginning. After that, then we can start building this building around it. But we have to have this as the beginning of everything, of our the captain, the, uh, the author of our faith. Well, I like about this, too. It says that the church is made up of living stones, people, you know, not a building. Like I believe in the Catholic Church, it says you're saved by... Uh, believing in Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church, you know, it's not a denomination, it's not a building, you know, it's a faith, it's a believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and in His gospel. That's the church. That's what I think is the where He comes in as chief cornerstone in the apostles' teachings, and then thank God uh, in 2013 here we're still a church, a living church waiting for his return. All right, we're going to um, go on to uh, Isaiah 9, 6. By the way, uh, for those of you who do not have your video up, uh, I don't know if you want to talk, uh, so just start talking. Anytime you want to say something or ask a question or make a point, just start talking. And I'll try to uh, know that you uh, pay attention to what you're wanting to speak. 
Okay, um, I'm here. I'm just. I'm, I don't want to cut anybody off. Okay, don't be shy. Cut people off. At least if you cut them off, then I'll, I'll say, okay, wait a second. You can go next. But I won't know if you want to talk unless you, unless you do that because I don't see you. the other people can kind of wave their hands on the camera. <laughs> right. I understand. Okay. So now let's go to Isaiah 9 6. And this is the fifth part of this series. And, and another uh, previous uh, videos, uh, we've gone into this in great detail. But let's touch on each of these points. Uh, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Let's start off with wonderful. That he is. <laughs> Go ahead, Brother Ronnie. I said that he is. <laughs> yeah, Brother Ronnie, you remember that uh, PM you sent me, uh, or was it a comment on the last video or something? He said, I'd like to have a chance for each one of us to say the identity of Jesus, who Jesus is to us. Oh, yeah. Maybe this is a good opportunity right now to do that. Because yeah, when you think He's the, the, one of the names or titles of Jesus is wonderful. Okay, I want to know, each person tell me, in what way is Jesus wonderful to you? And we're going to start with Brother Ronnie. Wow, <laughs> he means a lot to me. But for me right now, um, more than anything, he's like, uh, he's that brother that sticks, or he's that one that sticks closer than a brother. Uh, I'm going through a bit of a hard time physically getting towards the end, and uh, he just, he stands by me. I mean, I, I'm never alone. He's always with me. Uh, when I get into the Word, it's very personal. It's very, uh, my spirit becomes alive, and I know when he's talking to me. But he saved me a lot of things. I mean, when I got saved, I mean, it, it took a guy a long time to keep coming up to where I was and bothering me day after day. Uh, I'd be drinking beer and throwing the guy out of my house. But uh, thank God he kept coming. He kept coming at me with the Word of God. Uh, Christ saved me. He found me. Uh, it, it took me like um, three days of, of going back and forth and uh, getting angry about it, uh, trying to deny him. And finally I just fell on my face, bawling like a baby, something I don't do. And... Uh, if my brothers, uh, like biker brothers back then, would have seen me doing that, they would have thought uh, something was wrong with me. I ended up throwing out my collars, burning them, walking away from a club that should have killed me. I should be dead from them. Uh, yet God protected me. He stayed with me. I was able to walk the streets, witness to people, all by his power. And I give him all the glory for it. Uh, I've worked in a deliverance ministry where uh, the Lord has... See many come to freedom from uh, satanic bondage. And there we get into that legalistic business again. Uh, God has just been so good to me. And I know he's, he's here with me even now, even as he's with us. And you can just feel the love between all of us. And that's, that's it. Binding together he does by his Holy Spirit. And that, you know, he's going to see each of us all the way home. And, and to, to doubt him at any time, I guess, would be, I guess it's normal here and there. But he just he just floods his peace and his presence in our lives, and we just can't deny him. And uh, I was in kind of a bad mood today. I wasn't going to come in uh, on the show because I was listening to this, or watching some of these Muslim channels and what they're saying about our Lord. And then there's Christians saying they're Christians on these channels and denying the deity of Jesus Christ and agreeing with these people. I just see you know our world is going. Uh, to hell in a handbasket. It's, it's going slowly and surely towards that, that culmination of the age, ages, uh, towards the tribulation, which I still believe in, by the way, Eve. Uh, I see that happening where, you know, homosexuals have, have uh, pushed the preacher back in the closet instead of the, they came out of the closet to put, put, push the preachers back in. Uh, pretty soon it's going to be against the law to uh, preach the scriptures and to even talk about Jesus Christ. So I think we have ought to ready ourselves, uh, be ready for whatever comes, and never deny him, because he never denied us, and he never will. And he'll see each of us all the way home, like I said. I have faith for that. 
Yes, that's no, fantastic. No doubt. No doubt. Jesus is wonderful. Yeah. yeah, I'd say that makes him wonderful in my book. <laughs> How about Brother Joseph? When it says he is wonderful, how do you see that personally? Well, I, right now, uh, my my first reaction is to Brother Ron. Uh, what a beautiful uh, testimony and passion in his voice. And I think that's something we all have as believers. And uh, when we see someone else uh, speaking well about that passion, it just draws us together. Uh, we are one body. And I, and I think Christ is uh, uh, just amazing that, uh, that he can bring us into union or oneness. And uh, uh, all through my life, I, you know, I, uh, my testimony is, is, I guess, similar. I guess we all have a similar testimony in one way, one way or another. But uh, uh, wonderful. I mean, what do you say to that? Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You know, he grabs us where we're at, pulls us into this body and... Uh, I'm just thankful for that. You know, you know what bothers me too, brothers and sisters, is, is uh, people who they're just they're saved and then they walk away, and then people get on them out of fear to come back to, to God out of fear to try and make them afraid, like somehow they're going to end up going to hell. And there's so many verses that says that's not going to happen, but yet they still come back. And I see Jesus Christ as that master fisherman, you know, who casts his line out there and maybe he lets you run sometimes. But he always pulls you back in. He loves us. You know, he loves us enough to keep us and to hold us and to not let us go. If you look at the cross, if you look at the cross, there's no way, there's no way God the Father would allow his son to go through all that, and give us his precious promises, and then take him back. No, I can't see that. That's not a God of love. Then. And besides, it says God does not repent, change his mind. About his gifts or his calling. Okay, thank you, brother. Eve, do you have any thoughts on how Jesus is wonderful? Yeah. Uh, well, when I when I think of the word wonderful, the first thing that comes to my mind is wonder, and wonder to me is like um, in awe, and not just in awe, but also mysterious. And I, it, a beautiful mystery, not not just something that you can't really reach, because uh, the Lord reveals Himself uh, every day in new ways to us, and uh, we learn more and more as we grow in Him. So I, I think that that's um, that's what I see as as wonderful uh, about Christ in my life is that my spiritual growth um, it's just never ending, and and I don't ever want it to end. Um, if I ever came to the point where I thought I had all the answers, um, then that growth would just stop, and and I don't um, I don't care for that that thought at all. So, I see see Christ as wonderful, being uh, puts me in awe and and wants me to know more and more of His mysteries. Well, if you look at the word wonderful, this is mean full of wonder, and uh, that that kind of ring. That's the best definition of the word, the way you, the way you used it, Eve. Uh, you wonder, uh, revelations come to you, uh, God reveals more and more, and you'll still continue to wonder because the idea of God, the identity of God, is just so great that we will always wonder, never, never completely understand, but just be thankful. Uh, Brother Jackson, Jackson is uh, uh -huh. one... When Jesus is wonderful, uh, how does that hit you? Well, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I think the removal of fear is one of Jesus' most wonderful characteristics. Yeah. You know, in pretty much every other religion, it's be good and hope you make it. You know, to, to, to paraphrase it crudely, kind of cross your fingers and try your best. And, you know, I, I know some people who are devout Mormons and that they believe that you're saved after all you can do as they put it. Kind of like keep all the commandments, do this, and after all you do you're saved. See, in Jesus Christ what I think really stands out as wonderful about him is he, he removes our fear. You know, we, we, we start to obey him out of love like First John talks about and not out of fear. So I, I consider the lack of fear to be a very wonderful characteristic. Okay. How about Brother Austin? 
Yeah, I would. Uh, I would just like to touch on how he could show the entire human race just the power and the significance between tr truth and love. Because with those, they go hand in hand. But with they, they bring so much, and they show so many people just the right way to act and to be around other people and to show compassion and. I, I see it as truth and love have a power to it that can never be taken away. It's just a nap. It just comes with it. And the devil's uh, only counter to it would be the, the hate and the lies, but the only power they get are the power that people give it. So in reality, if there was nobody to support hate and lies, truth and love would be the only powers – how God intended the uh, the entire world to be, but since Satan has to always has to get at God, he always has to counter him some way. It, it, the, I see it as if there's one way, there's uh, Satan makes it the other. If uh, yeah, the seven seven seven, uh, Satan went with the six six six, and if there's love, Satan made uh, hate, and if there's truth, Satan made lies. He always has to counter it, but everything he tries to counter it always needs. That significant uh, human distinction to give it its power when God's power just reigns supreme without anybody needing to give it anything. So, how Christ is wonderful is he just he he's just naturally perfect. While uh, as we'll see or as to see, the Antichrist will need that. He'll need the. He'll feast off everybody's praise and worship, and he'll need people to follow him to make him great in their eyes because Christ didn't need that. He didn't need anybody to follow him. He's just God Almighty, and he didn't need uh, – he doesn't need anybody to show uh, – to tell him that. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't think this term is in Scripture. I believe I first heard it by uh, – he was Spurgeon, one of his sermons – he referred to Jesus as uh, his all in all, all in all, and uh, that's what I think of when I think of how wonderful Jesus is, is that he is the com completeness of everything to me. Uh, he, he is my creator. He is my life giver. He regenerated me, gave me eternal life. He is transforming me. And changing me and teaching me and uh, holding me securely no matter what I do, comforting me, guiding me. And he is my all in all. And I think that's wonderful that, that he is responsible for everything about me from my beginning to my end. And thankfully, the end will not come because he's given me eternal life. Okay, uh, let's look at the next word now. It says, uh, uh, Counselor. He's called Wonderful Counselor. Counselor. Uh, Eve, you want to go first? Well, um, <clears throat> when I think of Counselor, not only do I think of someone who gives advice and uh, tries to help you guide guide you, but also someone who is listening to your problems and your issues. And uh, so I, I see uh, Christ as just that, someone who is there for you to speak to and come to when you're struggling, and um, and he will guide you and give you uh, give you that uh, step forward where you need to go. You know. Yeah, that's a very good part that you uh, included in counseling. Sometimes he, 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 uh, he uh, draws us or moves us in a certain way or teaches us a certain thing and gives us a particular answer. But, but sometimes it's comforting to, to know that he's just always there to listen. And so when you have a counselor, you know, I've never been to a psychiatrist, but you know, a lot of people think that just having someone to talk to as a psychiatrist or a psychologist and get on the couch and talk is just very, very helpful. We always have someone to talk to. So, so Joseph, counselor. Uh, you know, I, I, 
I kind of just uh, agree with what Eve said and what you just said. It, it, you know, chicken soup for the soul. Uh, the Lord's always there and is always uh, available for us. And sometimes you don't feel him, but uh, you know he's there. Uh, Brother Jackson, let me ask everybody to do this. Uh, whenever one person is talking, everybody make sure that your own mic is muted because I, I get a lot of like feedback and background noises and stuff. Maybe if we all mute our mic, unless we're talking, maybe that will solve that problem. Okay? Uh, Brother Jackson? Uh-huh. Uh, so did I already ask you about this? or uh, Counselor? You asked me about the wonderful counselor. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so do you want to elaborate on the word counselor? Jesus? Okay, yeah, I actually only talked about wonderful. Good point. Yeah. Um, counselor is like I, I go to a I go to a therapist every week for counseling. She basically works through all the problems and and, and difficulties I face in my life, and I, I definitely think. God does that in our lives. I don't know if that's exactly what it's referring to here, though. I would have to check the Hebrew, because it does seem a little bit strange to me, not that it's impossible, in this context that it's talking about a counselor, because it's talking about him being, you know, the Savior to come right here, if that makes sense. Okay. All right. Uh, Brother Ronnie, Jesus being uh, our counselor. The counselor. Yeah, I see him coming, you know, in by his spirit, uh, teaching us, guiding us in the Word. And we look, we can look at uh, many, like uh, I call them heathens, but whatever. Uh, those who take the Word out of context and they just throw uh, something down, something down about Jesus, without seeing what it's in in its entire context. It's because they can't understand the whole Word of God coming together, that the whole Bible is actually about Jesus, uh, that the Holy Spirit is the one who teaches us and puts the Word together and uh, helps us to discern, you know, rightly the Word of God and divide it correctly. None of us can do that on our own, by our own uh, power. That has to be generated, I believe, from the counseling of Jesus Christ. Even so, uh, through my life as I grow, as he was talking about, in, an, in the knowledge of God, I mean, it's, it's like he as a counselor does tell me, you know, don't do this, don't do that, uh, shut up now, tell me to be quiet, or to say something, or to comfort somebody when they need it. Uh, he, he's, he's daily with us, counseling us, uh, as we keep our heart and our minds on him. That's why I see him as our counselor. Okay. Um, Austin, how, how do you see this title uh, in counselor? I'll touch on it with, I think, a significant part of it is it's kind of like uh, incorporated within just our alone time with uh, maybe it's prayer or just reflection. But it's just kind of like uh, as in Christ said in uh, John 14:26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy, uh, well, I'm, I apologize real fast. I see the the Counselor also, as Christ mentioned, is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and it's just to help us reflect how we've been doing or a question that we've had in our life or a scriptures or anything, and just to kind of bring that sense of peace and reminder or places we need to grow or help others with. It's just that we can be ourselves within ourselves and the Holy, after we're sealed with the Holy Ghost within salvation, we, we always have an opportunity to reflect or grow or get time to just kind of be with, be be at peace, be alone. As uh, as Christ did, he, he went alone sometimes just being at peace with the with the counselor and uh, how he was how he was tempted for 40 days, four nights by Satan. He was just praying the whole time, and basically that t sense of that counselor of the Holy Ghost keeping him keeping him all all together. It's just a, it's a very strong thing to have. It's a it's a wonderful gift, and uh, I'm really glad that we can we have that opportunity to have that whenever we need to because there are times where it gets really tough, but 
knowing that we always have uh, that sense to get the help we want or just the piece we need, uh, it's always there and offered to us. Mm -hmm. I think the idea of uh, being alone, uh, receiving his counsel, no one else around, that, uh, that means something to me. I, I don't know about you guys, if you have any particular prayer time each day, or you set aside the time, or, or if prayer is more spontaneous for you. But, uh, I, I pray all throughout the day, but I, I do have a, a kind of a routine. Of, I take a bicycle ride every day for about 40 minutes. And I'm out there by myself riding the bike. And particularly if I drive at a time where there's no traffic, and then I, uh, uh, it's really just me and Jesus, and this conversation, this counseling, this um, my my prayer time is really best under that circumstance. I'm out and just thankful for the creation, and uh, so I think uh, Jesus as counselor, uh, I think that's something that really needs to be while we're alone. Uh, just ignore my phone ringing. I don't know how. To, I forgot. I should have left it in the other room or unplugged it. <laughs> um, so I, the idea of uh, Jesus being our counselor right, and the idea of spending time alone with Jesus in our prayer, prayer or meditation, that's. Uh, I think that goes goes together. Uh, now, this verse, you know, we've already broken this down quite a bit in prior videos, but I, I want to remind everybody. This particular verse here uh, is uh, one of the favorites of modalists, and a modalist is someone who believes Jesus is God Almighty, but they believe that Jesus is the Father and Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus just changes forms. Uh, they're not three distinct persons, but one person who changes forms. And so when they, when a modalist sees this verse here, they really like some of the things that seems to help them with their their uh, doctrine. Uh, when it says that he is uh, uh, the, the mighty God, that's the next one we're coming to. Uh, the mighty God. Now we believe he is the mighty God, but uh, I know I don't know how you feel about this, Austin. Uh, everybody else on the panel has kind of expressed their viewpoint towards modalism or trinitarianism or not wanting to be labeled, or maybe not falling clearly in one camp or the other, but the idea that we all do agree that Jesus is God Almighty, and that's what this verse says here. It says he is uh, the mighty God, uh, the mighty God. It doesn't say a mighty God the way a Jehovah Witness would put it, like they did in 1 John 1, 1, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was a God, no, this is, he is the mighty God. And so a, a modalist would say, see, that's, he is God Almighty. But we, we see it, he is God Almighty, but he's a, he's a person. Now, let me start off with uh, Brother Austin, since I, I haven't heard him as his viewpoint on any of this. I, I apologize. What was I, uh, what did you, what are we getting at, Brother Luke? Well, the idea that Jesus is the mighty God, or God Almighty, uh, I think we all agree with that. But yeah, absolutely. Can, can you see how a modalist would take this verse and say that proves that modalism, oneness, is the correct way to see this Godhead, this uh, identity of Jesus, that Jesus is the Father, Jesus is the Son, Jesus is the Holy Spirit. He just changes forms. Uh, and uh, this this particular verse here, the mighty God, they could use that verse for their for their cause. I apologize. What are they called? Mo modalists. Modalists. Yeah. Mod okay. Well, uh, we've got we've gone into this idea in great detail in the, in the prior videos on this uh, series, uh, comparing modalism and, and trinitarianism. So. Uh, uh, let me go on to the uh, others since they're already very really familiar with this. And, and also, the mighty God and the everlasting Father. Both of these verses here, a modalist would say, see, Jesus is the everlasting Father. Jesus is the mighty God. Okay, so uh, um, let's, start, let's start with Eve. 
well, uh, since I'm kind of the no label, don't really want to go either or, I'll just uh, pass it to Joe here. Okay, Brother Joseph. Oh, thanks, Eve. Uh, <laughs> totally unprepared. I, you know, I, I really think that this is uh, the Old Testament uh, uh, revelation of the oneness within the Godhead. Uh, I, I don't. I'm kind of like Eve. I, I really don't uh, know how to. Well, I, I don't want to put this in her mouth, but I, I don't know how to verbalize this. But I, I, I do see this would be like the the gold standard for any modalist. Uh, but for me, I'm, I'm thinking that this verse refers to the oneness of God prior to the Incarnation. I, I don't know. It, it calling him the Everlasting Father and uh, the Son in the same ver verse does speak to modalism, doesn't it? I, I don't believe in modalism, but if I did, <laughs> this would be my gold standard. Do you remember when we went over this verse before and discussed the term uh, the everlasting Father? What we uh, what we learned? Uh, I know that Brother Jackson can speak on that. Right, right. And uh, unlike the others, I proudly wear the label Trinitarian. I almost need a T-shirt that says that. <laughs> but then. It okay. I can't hear Jackson. Can anybody else hear him? Jackson. We, we don't hear you. All right. Let's go with Brother Ronnie, and when Jackson comes back, we'll uh, see. see uh, Brother Ronnie? Well, I don't think we're going to, as, as the creation, be able to explain God uh, in, in the best, I mean, in, in a way that uh, I don't be, will truly befits him. Because we are trying to explain God Almighty, our Creator, but uh, this everlasting God, you know, is uh, that word that the Jews always say it's a uh, hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, one God, and yet Jesus says, uh, "I and the Father, I and I and the Father, the Father and I are one," and I see that as. Jesus being Almighty God, also that uh, is one being, the Creator being, in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That uh, maybe we can't uh, full picture understand in, in our created mold yet, but we will see and understand when we see Him. But I too uh, consider myself a Trinitarian because that's the only way I can wrap this around in my head. Because Jesus prays to the Father. That he is the image of the Father. He is the grace and truth that comes from the Father. He is the Prince of Life. He is the, uh, the Alpha and Omega. And it's, it's and like in Hebrews 1 8, it says, uh, But of the Son, talking about God now, but of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is your scepter forever. Here the Father is talking to the Son. And. Uh, this is prior to, I believe, it, uh, maybe even time itself. But I can't, I can't wrap my head around God just being one and skipping through dimensions like that. That I mean, maybe could, but I just, I can't comprehend that as a creation, a creative being. Uh, let me see. Um, I got. Uh, 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 Brother Jackson is having technical problems, but he's texting. If anybody wants to read his text, for some reason my screen isn't covering. Oh, there it is. I can get it. I need it. Yeah, it says uh, the Hebrew, in my opinion, disproves modalism. The word "father" is nowhere in the Hebrew of this verse at all. Okay, thank you, Brother Jackson. I hope you can get your technical problem fixed. And but let me just say that uh, if you look at the various translations. And, and also what the uh, commentaries that talk about this verse, this, this particular title, the Everlasting Father, uh, they, the way that they normally look at this is that he is the Father of everlasting, the Father of eternity, uh, and that he is, uh, in other words, he created all things. So he's the Father of time, the Father of the, uh, the material world, because he created it all, the Everlasting Father. Um, so that's how normally the, they, they would refute the idea that he is the Father in person. 
Uh, but then we also have uh, this verse here certainly helps anybody, whether you're modalist or Trinitarian, when it declares that he is the mighty God. Okay, so uh, let's go next to, uh, oh, the Prince of Peace. I don't want to forget that. Uh, how about Eve? Or no, brother, brother Austin, counselor, mighty God. Yeah. Oh, okay. You guys have a chat going on there, Brian. <laughs> I see. Good. Uh, brother Austin, uh, what do you have to say about this uh, term, the Prince of Peace? Uh, one thing, real fast, brother Luke, is uh, can I just ask real fast what religion holds to uh, modelism? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, let me do this also for your benefit and also anybody else who uh, maybe hasn't seen all the other videos. Um, uh, modalism, uh, or a synonym, and a synonym for modalism is oneness. Uh, and it's, uh, it's the belief that there is one God who, who simply operates in three modes or manifests himself in three different ways, but does not, that it does not exist as three distinct persons simultaneously. Uh, and that is held by uh, Pentecostals, oneness Pentecostals. It's also held by the Church of Christ. And there may be others uh, who are just individuals, maybe Eve or someone else who, uh, who may not be identifying with a particular denomination. Uh, any, some individuals may also come to this conclusion. Uh, but the problem with, with modalism, as we pointed out throughout this study over and over again, is that there are numerous examples of Jesus praying to another person. So if Jesus is praying to the Father, uh, we would have to determine that he's like this street person, uh, this schizophrenic, talking to himself as he's walking in the street, he's talking to himself, not another distinct person. Uh, then there's also the idea that Jesus is sitting on the throne and the Father is sitting on the throne, side by side. And then there's also the example that at the baptism of Jesus, where you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all at the same point, at the same time, distinct. So there are many ways that we can, we can say modalism doesn't make sense, but also there are many verses that modalism, modalists can use to try to make their, their case. And uh, that's why when I come to one, when I come to a voice, verse, whether it's for modalism or for whether it's work salvation or whether it's, it's for uh, any, any subject, I want to look at how other people see it who may disagree with us. But let's look at it and discuss it and see why they think that and see if we, see if we have an answer. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's move on to this idea of the Prince of Peace. Oh, Brother Ron, go ahead. Yeah, I'd just uh, like to jump in back to what you are just talking about. Um, you know, the Hebrews, they believe in one God only. And because of that, when Jesus proclaimed himself as I am, they wanted to stone him and kill him. The Muslims believe in one God, and that's why they can't uh, accept the Trinity. It drives them crazy. Uh, so I can understand that, you know, you know, in a way, but it's like it takes the Holy Spirit to reveal this to our hearts, I believe, the, the Trinity. Like, uh, they believe in a God who can't become man, or a God who can't do something. We believe in the God who can, you know, the God of the impossible, who can become man and redeem us. Whereas they believe that God, their God, which isn't our God, Allah, um, cannot do these things. So I just want to throw that in. Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, we're all trying to find a way to understand and verbalize God as one, and yet Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are God. So modalists try to explain it in that way, and a, a Trinitarian explains it in another way. But what Trinitarians sometimes are charged with is polytheism, because people say you believe in three gods, uh, three separate persons. But we do not believe in three separate persons. We think we believe in three distinct. That means they're not separate gods, but they're distinct persons, uh, but still only one God. Now, how can you make sense of that? Um, I, I, I've used the example uh, when uh, in Genesis when it said, let us make God, man in our image. If man is made in God's image, and man is body, soul, and spirit, yet I am only one man, then that is a, in God's image. I am triunity, body, soul, spirit, and, and yet I'm still just one Luke. Okay. 
But uh, can now I, let's go on. Let, can of, I say something on yes, what you just said? Yes. Um, the only thing that I would find difficulty with that is that your mind, body, and spirit, your mind does not uh, leave your body to operate. Your spirit does not leave your body to operate. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a flaw in it. I can't think of any perfect illustration. Some people have said, well, what about water? Sometimes it's liquid, sometimes it's solid, sometimes it's gas. But the problem is that doesn't that doesn't prove mo uh, trinitarianism. and that really proves modalism because well, it's just water that changes forms into three different forms. So uh, no matter how we try to explain trinitarianism, there's always some hole in it. There's always some it's imperfect. That's the best I can do, though. I, I don't know if people would classify me as a modalist. I would hope that I wouldn't be put into that label. Um, but I would see it as as how you explained it, except um, that they do operate. Um, if you wanted to say mind, body, and soul, uh, that they do operate outside of one another. But they're still that uh, they're still one. If that makes any sense, my my belief is that there are, uh, um, that Christ is the essence of the Father. I don't know uh, of any other way to explain that, but that's the way that I see it so far, unless he, you know, teaches yeah. me otherwise. Yeah, that's the, that's the that's the kind of the key word that we we look at as um, that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father are if one God, one substance or one essence. That is the essence or substance of God, and yet three distinct persons, or if you want to refer to as personalities, or however. Uh, but, uh, they're one, they're not one in identity, they're one in substance. Okay? Now let's start going to this idea that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Uh, and is there anybody else, my question is, is there anybody else in the Bible who's referred to as the Prince of Peace? Uh, real quick, not on the Prince of Peace, but isn't uh, Satan also a prince? Or, fa or declared himself as a prince? Uh, well, I, he, yes, he may have the title of prince somehow. I, I, I'm prince not, of Power uh, of the Air? Yeah, yeah prince, prince of Power of the Air. Of the air okay? yeah. but, but, but Satan or Lucifer never has the title of Prince of Peace. Right. But, right, but just... there, is another, there is another person in the scriptures that's called the Prince of Peace. And it says he has no father or mother, no beginning or end, no end of days. Oh, Melchizedek. Melchizedek. That's the, he's the priest, right? The high priest? Who's yes. Christ? The, the high priest Melchizedek that Abraham gave tithes to. Now, uh, at some point in the future, I want to do uh, uh, topics on these hangouts uh, on uh, character studies, of doing uh, various characters in the Bible, Melchizedek being one. Uh, and also um, uh, what are called Christophanies or Theophanies, where Jesus appeared uh, in the flesh, or the Father appeared in the flesh as a person. For example, in the Garden of Eden, it said God walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. Uh, so there's many examples throughout scriptures before Jesus was born in the manger of God being in the flesh, wrestling with Jacob, and so on. So we'll do a real thorough study on this sometime. But for now, let me just say that Melchizedek, uh, I believe, is, is Jesus. because. Uh, he, uh, yeah, because that that's what I was trying to refer to. Yeah, he is. He There's no other conclusion you can come to. Uh, and, and when we get into studying Melchizedek, you'll see that, that these are attributes that only could apply to Jesus. Or to Father, but the, he's Melchizedek's called the Prince of Peace. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace, and and so my question is, what did, what do you, what does the Prince of Peace mean? Real quick, Brother Luke, uh, isn't yeah. Melchizedek uh, wasn't he from the Levitical bloodline? Uh, he was before them because uh, way way before them, uh, but. Uh, they have the Aaronic priesthood, the, the, the Jews had that, but the Melchizedek priesthood is, was, was much earlier, uh, and uh, the Mormons have tried to declare their supremacy 
and that they, they have reinstated this Melchizedek priesthood. Uh, but uh, we'll get into that too. I'm going to do. A, I'm, we're going to also do a discussion on Mormonism here, maybe in the very near future. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I well, like Prince of Peace. Who wants to just say what the word Prince, the term Prince of Peace, might mean? I, I, I just. Oh, I apologize. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that I, I think he, the title uh, did not come about until the New Testament in, in uh, Christ's sake where he uh, uh, brought peace between us and the Father, maybe. Okay. Uh, so, reconciliation. When you really reconcile with someone, you make peace with them. And uh, this is the, the gospel of reconciliation. Now, man is separated from God because of sin being a barrier. They, uh, there's a curtain, a veil, and a tabernacle separating, and, and we, we are separated from the Holy of Holies. And then um, we are now, when Jesus was crucified and died, the curtain was torn open. Now this barrier between man and God is no longer there. The sin barrier is removed because Jesus paid for our sins. And now we all have access to God, uh, because sin's not the issue. We can come to Jesus Christ because he paid for our sins, and we can receive eternal life because he's the giver of eternal life, and uh, there's nothing holding us back except desiring it, believing it. Uh, so, yeah, we can have peace and reconciliation through Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Uh, who else wants to expound more on that? I was just going to say that uh, Christ says in another verse that he is uh, he is the peace in general, and that was uh, John fourteen twenty seven. Uh, What's says, that? I was just saying where Christ in another verse says that uh, he is the peace. It was uh, John fourteen twenty seven. Yes. He says, uh, "Peace I leave with you; my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid." Amen. Okay. Amen. All right. Uh, I think, yeah. Go ahead, Eve. Uh, I did want to say, uh, as far as uh, Prince of Peace, it, it's kind of like uh, Ron, uh, Ron was talking about earlier. Uh, <clears throat> those without Christ have that void, and they're they're constantly searching to have that void. And once you come into Christ, that void is is full. And as long as you um, you know, I know I know that there are some saved individuals and some Christians out there. Believe me, I've been through this. That uh, don't necessarily rest in the peace uh, because they're still stuck in having to work uh, for something. But one, if you just uh, allow yourself to rest in Christ, then then that peace is there. Um, so, and it's a very strong peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another way of looking at peace. Not only are we reconciled. And we, there's peace between us and God, but we can have peace, knowing peace of mind, knowing that we're eternally secure and that uh, He's faithful to keep His promise of giving us everlasting life. So that's very good even that He added that in, because not only do we get reconciled, but now we can rest in it and have peace of mind. All right. Let's uh, now let's move on to uh, Revelation 1:5. Uh, faithful witness. And from Jesus, who is the faithful witness, and the begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Uh, so, faithful, who is the faithful witness? The faithful witness. I brought Brother Joseph. I, I always have something to say, Luke. <laughs> and, uh, faithful, faithful witness. Uh, absolutely, that goes right back to uh, him uh, being our uh, our defense attorney up there. I, I think uh, uh, he's always there to to stand up for us and uh, to put down Satan's wiles against us. The faithful witness. Okay. Uh, well, let's look at. Uh, Three, all three of the words, the, 
faithful and witness. Okay, how about Bro no. Brother Ronnie? Well, he faithfully witnessed uh, the revealing of the Father to us. He okay, was a faithful witness, huh? I want you. I want you to address each word individually. The yeah. faithful witness. Uh, I don't know how to explain the. <laughs> okay. Faithful. Um, you can be counted on. Uh, witness. Uh, the perfect uh, observer to get a report on. Okay. All right, Eve, you were going to say something. Yeah. Um, well, I was. I was just thinking with faithful. Um, that that um, stresses to me true, truth. Um, and with the uh, witness, it stresses to me someone who proclaims something uh, that they've experienced or have seen. So um, it actually brings to mind that verse that, that states that uh, there are three that bear witness, um, and you know Christ is Christ has come to share the truth, and so that is the faithful witness. Um, he is sharing um, the truth of, of spirituality. So. Hey, uh, if, if it but like I said, wasn't wasn't he faithfully? Didn't he faithfully witness God to us? To mankind, I mean, we'd have no idea what God was truly like. Yet He became flesh, and dwelt among us, truly revealing God to us. Faithful witness uh, to His finished work, and then uh, <clears throat> what God is like, and who God is, who the Father is. Yeah, and faithful. He was a faithful witness in that. Yeah, hey, uh, you guys discuss this a little more. Give me a minute; I'll be right back. Discuss this faithful. <laughs> Well, and faithful also represents loyalty as well. So, you know, yeah. he's loyal to the end. Yeah, he's a faithful witness of us too, right? Our lives and our testimonies. And yeah. And, and hey, Eve, can you recount that scripture you were just saying about there are three who are witnesses? There are three that bear witnesses. There are three that bear witness. Um, I don't know what scripture it is. It sounds pretty Trinitarian. Hey, it's all up here. Yeah, the Father. The... It's uh, I, I don't remember chapter verses. I just know it's all up here. Well, I, all I've got to say, Eve, is that sounds very Trinitarian of you. Oh. <laughs> tricky, tricky. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I see that I can, I see that there's arguments for both sides. To be honest, um, so I just don't I don't like I just don't like the labels because there's a lot of misconceptions and misrepresentations that come with with labels. So, so uh, Jackson just gave a, a real good uh, verse uh, reference for for that label you almost put on yourself. What was it? Uh, it's in the uh, chat section. First John five seven. Yeah. Josh, what, how come you're muted? I mean, did somebody mute you, or do you have a technical problem? Me. Or is that his name? I don't know his name. Yeah. Sorry. Jackson. Jackson's Jackson. Not okay. Technically, something's going wrong with Jackson's stuff, and then we got Austin here also, but he's he doesn't have a camera. No. Hey, let me. I don't know what you guys concluded on this, but let me tell you my thoughts on these three words. The faithful witness. The means exclusive. There's only one. Okay. Uh, faithful means that you can depend on it. You can rely on it. You can count on it. it you can trust it. It's faithful. Jesus is faithful to keep his promise that he made to us to give us eternal life. And witness is, what does a witness do? A witness testifies. Mm -hmm. If you were a witness and someone says, tell us what happened, you testify to it. So I think that these, uh, the faithful witness, uh, one of the things, even a, little, a word like the can be very important. It's like Jehovah Witnesses when it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. 
by putting one little word in there, they totally changed it. They said the word was a god. So they, um, uh, every little word, whether it's a, and, the, these words can be very, very important. Even the word the. Okay, uh, Brother Austin? Just, yeah, I was going to just touch on it real quick. Uh, I like how it is worded like that, the faithful witness. Uh, it's this, he holds that title alone, only him. And uh, it's also mentioned also with, uh, we could do the commandment, thou shall not bear false witness. And then that's also incorporated in uh, Romans 3, 4. And it's something that no man could ever equal since all have lied, uh, as in it says, God forbid, yet let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, thou, sh the, thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome, and thou art judged. Only Christ has never lied, so he could only be that faithful witness. He could only be the one that would tell the absolute truth every single time. And uh, if any man tried to do that, it wouldn't. He couldn't hold that title because he's fallen short of it. Okay. Uh, I think that's uh, this the fact that he's the only one is a very important distinction to make. Okay, let's go on now to uh, uh, Revelation one seventeen. And when I saw him. Everybody mute your microphones with me. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. We talked about the first and the last already in another verse, didn't we? So I guess uh, we'll skip that. Okay. Now let's go over to... Uh, Let's go to uh, let's go to uh, Revelation one five. This first begotten again. Again, some of these things we've gone into great detail, but this is a, this is a title, and we can at least discuss it for a minute again. Uh, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the again the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead. The Prince of the Kings of the Earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Oh, I, I read that verse. That's the one we just did a minute ago. It's the exact same one, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so let's look at the term first begotten. Remember, I missed that last time. First begotten. We talked about it before. Can anybody recall how we uh, see this? as Jesus being the first begotten, in this case, first begotten of the dead. Uh, Brother, Brother Austin, you want to go first on this one? Oh, I apologize. What was it, Brother Luke? The, when Jesus is called the first begotten of the dead, what does it mean, the first begotten? Uh, from, like, what I mentioned earlier, the only... Is this like the only begotten, or is this another reference to begotten? No, this is the, this is the first begotten, uh, and it's referring to the resurrection. And the first begotten of the dead. The, the title that he was the first to ever come back from, from the dead? Okay. Uh, that's, that's correct. But what is the distinction between him and Lazarus and him and Dorcas? Because Dorcas and Lazarus were both resurrected from the dead. Eve, why don't you talk about that? Yeah, I'm not too sure on that one, Luke. Well, <clears throat> there were resurrections uh, from the dead in the Old Testament as well. So, yeah, I, I, yeah I think, um, and I hope I explain this right because I don't want people to think that I'm suggesting that Christ was ever separate separate from the Father, but I think it's um, a representation of the reconciliation being present, um, if that makes any sense at all. 
his uh, death and resurrection was that very reconciliation for mankind uh, to the Father. Hope that makes sense. Okay. All right. I, I know that you probably have a totally different take on this whole off concept of resurrection anyway, because of your other viewpoint on uh, end times. So, so uh, okay, I can see that Brother Ronnie's waving his hand. Go ahead. Well, Jesus was uh, resurrected from the dead on the uh, festival of first fruits, and uh, I'm a believer in the rapture, where it says, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, uh, Christ Himself will descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and that we um, will be caught up together with Him in the clouds, and we'll be changed in a twinkling of an eye. So uh, Jesus Christ has a the difference between Him and anybody else that was resurrected. His his new but his his uh, resurrection body is is not only different but it, it's eternal and it can't ever be harmed it, and it has uh, a whole lot of different powers than what it, he or what us in our bodies would have or Lazarus or Dorcas being raised from the dead whereas we too have that that blessed hope the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So when we get raised, we'd be like him. Our bodies would be like Ante his. So he's the firstborn, the first begotten from the dead. And us as adopted children of, of God, uh, we are promised to uh, follow suit. Uh, okay, Ronnie, I see you moving. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. It, uh, it was, Eve, okay, you're all back. Because there was like a little frozen moment there, like 30 seconds, I thought, I think. But uh, okay. Did you guys hear me? Uh, no, I we yeah. missed we missed we missed like a two thirds of the, the last two thirds of what you said. But so he he okay. was resurrected. Um, he had a glorified body that's eternal. Okay. What right, and we too, we too are promised that. It's it says uh, in talking about the rapture, which I believe in. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, it says our bodies we will be like our bodies will be like his unto his, and as adopted children we have that blessed hope to look forward to, in the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So he is the first begotten from the dead, and we as adopted children will follow suit. We have that promise. Our bodies will be like unto his. Well, we won't ever die again. You know, okay. we will have bodies that will be eternal and like his. Yeah, we promise okay. that. So Ronnie, Ronnie elaborated on Jesus's resurrection. Uh, draw the distinction between the difference between Jesus's resurrection and Lazarus's resurrection, brother Joseph. Uh, yeah, I think Ron uh, Ron covered that really well. Uh, you, you cut out during that part, so you didn't hear it, but. Oh, okay. um, he he uh, he had mentioned that uh, Lazarus and, and the other one I, I forget the name uh, were resurrected in in earthly uh, unperfected bodies and Christ of course is uh, resurrected in, in in perfection or an eternal body uh, like we will be uh, I was born several years before the Beatles ever hit America <laughs> and right about now my body's breaking down pretty bad uh, I guess Ron Jackson we both have all have problems everyone here except uh, Eve and, and Luke are uh, not not pretty and, and young anymore uh, it, it, we're all we're all hoping for that new body oh boy okay yeah, you, you don't know <laughs> you know when I get a conversation with any of my old friends we always talk about our doctors our medicines our ailments and stuff you got me pigged all wrong there, Brother Joseph. Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, we're going to end the show in a minute here, so we'll make this the last uh, uh, verse for this episode. But I agree that the difference in this being the first begotten uh, of the dead is means that Jesus is the first of that kind that will be have this glorified body that will never die again that has immortality. Paul says that we are, we are mortal and we will put on immortality. So we're going to, when we have this immortal body, like Jesus' glorified body, then uh, we'll, we'll never die again as Lazarus, and Dorcas, and the Old Testament characters that were resurrected. 
So uh, that's that's the distinction. He being the first begotten of the dead, who will have these glorified bodies. Okay. What I want to do is I want to give each person just a minute to make a closing remark about anything in the show, uh, and then uh, also tell ever, anybody in the audience uh, the name of your channel. I hope anybody who's watching will subscribe to all of the uh, the panelists. Today. We're going to start with you. Did you say with me? Yes. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I was paying attention to Jay over here in the chat. Um, I just wanted to uh, to uh, thank you for having me again, and I, I thought we had a great time. And um, you know, I thought this was good um, going through the titles of of Christ. He's got many, 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 many titles. So. So I, I find it um, very good that we can all meet and, and fellowship and discuss these things. So thanks, yeah. Luke. Okay, and, and you're right. There's many more. I've got four pages, and we only went through one today. I was hoping to get through all of them today. But I guess I don't run a rush too much because this is not something to be rushed through, I don't think. I, I think we need to take our time and savor it. Even if this particular topic ends up going a couple of more episodes, we, we need to be fair to it. Rushing over it, uh, brother, brother Joseph. Uh, I'm. I just. I love the the Sundays. I look forward to two o'clock Sunday to sit down here and have fellowship and and learn and uh, and think about things. Uh, I will. Uh, Jackson's audio is out. But he's uh, he's saying that uh, he would encourage everyone to look at Hebrew for uh, Isaiah nine six. And that's that is his closing statement. It says here in chat. Don't you look at the Hebrew for Isaiah nine Yeah, uh, he's referring to the fact that in Hebrew there's no reference to the word father in terms of in Hebrew it has everlasting father, but in Hebrew there's no reference to the word father. So that's thank you, thank you, brother Jackson, and uh, we miss the sound of your voice. Uh, so we got Eve Whale, uh, Eve Whalen, but her ch her YouTube channel is Eve Whale, E V E W A L E. So please subscribe to her. We got Brother Joseph that just spoke. His YouTube channel is J Byron, J B Y R O N. And we got Brother Jackson, who uh, audio is out right now. His YouTube channel is Mecca Wing Zero, and that, that's Brother Jackson. And then we got Brother Ronnie. Go ahead next. Make any closing remark you want to say about the show today. Well, I love the fellowship today. I love getting together with our brothers and sister believers. Um, I do look forward to this, though sometimes I can't make it because of physical reasons. Um, I just, I just like to throw out there. I mean, my channel is nothing. I got one video on there. And, and that means a lot to me, and I think it would mean a lot to anybody who actually sees it and takes it to heart. And that's the love of God, that God loves us. And, you know, he, he, he gave us Jesus Christ to reconcile us all back unto himself. You don't have to come to him with fear anymore. God loves you. He, he loves you with a full heart. And he gave his son on the cross for you. I mean, you, God so loved the world that he gave, put your name in there, his only begotten son, that whosoever, that means you, you know, can be saved. And it's just to believe in Jesus Christ alone, in Christ alone, and what he did alone. You know, stop being afraid, stop pushing away, uh, plug your ears up to the enemy, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to see you all again one day, and make it forever. God bless you. Okay, brother, thank you. And now we got Brother Austin. Uh, his, uh, his YouTube channel is Austin Bell, but I don't know if you'll be able to see that because it's written in Greek. <laughs> brother Austin, any final uh, remarks? Uh, thank you for having me today, Brother Bill. It's, or, sorry, Brother Luke. It's been an uh, excellent time. Uh, it's nice to fellowship and uh, always grow. And it's uh, I pray it's in the future that we can continue to do this. All right, thank you, brother. I, I was happy that you were interested and in, uh, able to uh, to join us, and I, I hope you can continue to participate in this. Uh, uh, 
have a panelist. When I close the show off, don't go away because I want to talk to you privately for a few minutes after we end the broadcast. But let me just say this to anybody watching the video, whether it's live or uh, on YouTube later. Uh, it, if you have never put your faith in Jesus uh, as your Savior, then I'm going to ask you to do it right now. I'm, I'm, we're not asking you to join a religion. We're not asking you to become a religious person or follow any set of religious rules. Uh, there's nothing required of you to receive eternal life except trusting our Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. He is God Almighty who became a man. He died for all of our sins. So now sin is no longer a barrier between us and God. And Jesus wants you to have life everlasting uh, in the kingdom of God. He's offering it to you right now as a free gift. There's no strings attached. Nothing's required of you except putting your complete faith in Jesus. But you cannot divide your faith between Jesus and your religion and your personal merit or anything else. I'm asking you to go 100% all in on Jesus. You can depend completely on him, rely on him, trust him, and nothing else. And he will give you eternal life. It's free. I hope you do it. And if you do... Well, you've said to rest in him too, brother, right? Yes, and rest in him, that means you don't have to worry anymore. Once you receive this gift of eternal life, don't worry. It's settled, and he'll never take back his gift. He's promised it, and he is faithful who keeps his promises. So uh, if you do decide to put your faith in our Savior, Jesus, uh, please make a comment and tell us. We'd love to all know about it and celebrate with you. So uh, I'm going to end the broadcast now. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.